Welcome to another City Planner Masters where I take you through a University Masters module about urban planning all while building my city skylines to City of Thornton. In this module I will be answering some big questions like should we really care about transport and mobility? What happens if we ban cars from streets? What are the guideline requirements for freight, buses and emergency vehicles? And how can I make a livable and connected street? So let's learn all things roads. But first, let's head into my city Thornton, and before we make any changes, let's look at the traffic flow and road data. Thornton, by default of the game's AI, is very car orientated, and because I'm currently building vanilla and with milestones turned on, the challenge is even harder to steer my city away from car centrism. Because no reputable urban planner plans a car-centric city or town, especially these days. Modern urban planning, as we have learnt in the previous modules, is all about making a city to human scale and a city that benefits humans. But vehicles do have their place and need to be catered for, as do pedestrians and cyclists. So rather than say I'm making a walkable city or a car-centric city, a better term to use is I'm making a livable city. So what is a livable community anyway, or is it just another city planning buzzword? Let's explore Module 3. Former US Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood defined livability as a community where you can take kids to school, go to work, see a doctor, go to the grocery store, have dinner and a movie, and play with your kids in a park, all without having to get into a car. So let's do just that in Thornton and turn half my roads into pedestrian roads and paths as a simulation and see how many people choose to walk. While I do this, let's drill down on this livable community concept. The first thing to remember is that a livable community is drivable as well, but the reverse is not true. Once a place is built around driving, walking is impractical for most purposes. The need to get around by car for every errand is not really freedom. The car is your master. The livable city is the freedom to own a car, but drive it less. If you drive 5,000 miles a year instead of 15,000 miles or 20,000 miles, you can keep it three times longer and save about $5,000 a year. A livable city also has a focus on the public realm, with the former mayor of Bogota, Colombia, stating that a good public space yields happiness, and this can be achieved through public art, proximity to amenities, festive events, playgrounds and parks, and a place for chance encounters, to socialise with people you know and bump into. Let's do just that with our little community we have made in Thornton, and randomly see how citizens start to feel. So let's get back to the reason why we are all here. Cars. The ideological battle around cars has only just begun, with cities at opposite ends of the spectrum. The USA has a staggering 908 motor vehicles per 1,000 people, coming in first after we remove micro-nations from the list and Rayleigh, North Carolina, with the highest use. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a city like Oslo, Norway, which is aiming to make the city car-free. So how do urban planners handle such a position, especially if employed in Houston? or Dallas where as much as 70% of urban land is given over to cars and parking legally. As an adult, have you ever lived without a car? Let's run another simulation on Thornton that caters to the cars and let's see what happens to traffic, health, happiness, population when we remove all the buses, taxis, paths and parks and replace them with parking lots. Let's look at the metrics before this experiment and then we will look at them after. While the simulation runs, let's deep dive into Module 3's theory and the hierarchy of streets. Even in Roman cities, main roads, which were 12.2 metres, were differentiated from secondary roads at 6 metres and tertiary roads at 4.5 metres. The modern street hierarchy emerged in the 1920s as growing car ownership began to create visible conflicts with other road users. The concept of designing wider roads for faster, heavier traffic going longer distances, limiting speed and excluding some sorts of traffic from local streets became orthodox during the 1930s to 1950s. It marked the emergence of lower density car dependent suburbs. 
Vehicle movement is enabled by a street hierarchy ranging from limited access regional freeways, arterial distributors, sub-arterial collectors, major minor collectors to local access roads. Traffic volume, design speed, types of users and access point density differs along this hierarchy, as do adjacent land use and built form. Yoshin Hack from Leibniz University in Hanover says spatial distribution of road types is just as important as zoning and densities. After analysing thousands of road hierarchies in 20 city neighbourhoods, he found on average that cities devoted 12% of road networks to arterial, 15% to collectors or access roads, but surprisingly he found that 72% of a neighbourhood's road network is devoted to a form of local or residential road. Now remember, this study was on neighbourhoods, not business districts or industrial parks. It feels like a healthy mix, doesn't it? The majority of roads are community focused, but not when he compared his study neighbourhood with traffic volume. He found the traffic volume through local streets was high. Does this mean the neighbourhood needs more roads, or better public transport, or better walkable access to facilities? As you would see, I'm building this layout in City Skylines 2 with density and zoning based on what I can see on his map. Let's get to this area later and see how the traffic holds up. Let's look at some target numbers from Blacktown City Council in Australia, which is a metropolitan council. According to the Roads Directorate in Blacktown, they aim for under 15,000 cars per day on an arterial road, like this, compared to 2,000 in a regional council, which is outside of a city centre. But it gets interesting when you compare the local access roads. Blacktown targets a maximum of 2,000, whereas a regional council only targets 200 vehicles. This shows the stark difference between city and country, and that major regional country arterial roads are just like city local access roads in terms of volume. Jonathan Barnett, a US-based urban designer, argues that heavily congested arterial streets effectively sterilise the commercial strips they serve because congestion restricts access to businesses along the strip. It's impossible to make right-hand turns at unsignaled intersections, for instance. He argues that by concentrating traffic to just a few streets, like Hack's study here did, we create negative and inefficient congestion and push traffic into local areas, or what is often referred to as rat runs. What solutions are there to solve this? Should more than 12% of a community's road network be devoted to arterials? Or what about RAC in the UK's solution to this to make rat running illegal by using bollards and pavement build-outs to push traffic out of the local areas and back onto the arterial? Other organisations have also been vocal in propagating more outlandish ideas. Bicycle New South Wales in 2022 blamed Google Maps for encouraging rat runs, citing UK research that pedestrians are 17% more likely to be killed on local roads and have called for 30 km or 20 miles per hour speed limits. Are these creative solutions? If City Skylines 2 had these mods already, I'd like to drop the speed limits and see how motorists behave. Behave. Would the game have less traffic accidents? Or are traffic accidents in city skylines too random and not dependent on the speed limit and road type? So let's turn to Oslo for our first creative solution, and that is to simply remove parking and use that space for non-car purposes like parklets or a cycle route as you see here. Donald Schrupp in his book, The High Cost of Parking, argues that eliminating minimum parking requirements would reduce the cost of urban development, improve urban design, reduce automobile dependency, and restrain urban sprawl. And as I have said, some Texan cities devote up to 70% of land to parking. 
In Japan, you cannot own a car without a registered parking space. To purchase a car, you must first head to the local police station and prove you own or rent a non-surface road parking space, such as a residential driveway, a spot in a parking garage or parking lot, and it must be within 200 meters of your house. Only then will police issue you with a certificate, and then you can head to the dealership to buy a vehicle. Is this one method to ameliorate the blight of street parking? However, others have pointed to the cost of providing parking and the impact on housing affordability. Arguments in favour of removing minimum parking requirements have been both justified because they address greenhouse gas emissions by discouraging private car travel and bettering affordability problems, especially with housing. Let's learn a lesson from St. Paul and Minneapolis in the USA. This area is now the largest metro in the US to introduce progressive parking reforms. The city not only wanted to address its housing affordability crisis, but to also reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2040. The city modernized its zoning codes to fully eliminate off-street parking minimums for real estate developments. This also included most buildings with a half mile radius of transit stations and the removal of other bizarre zoning laws like daycare centers being forced to provide 28 parking spots for a staff of 12 alongside the green line light rail and bicycle lanes the changing of the zoning laws proved a success not just for the environment but also for developers who were now could unlock land for housing but not all developers were on board this continues to be a contentious strategy with developers arguing that apartments in high density inner city neighborhoods will be less desirable if they don't include parking and that community opposition to redevelopment and density will increase. Regardless, St. Paul and Minneapolis was seen as a success, so much so that the DET in America cited that Detroit should next take the plunge. The next question is how do we connect a place with the unavoidable road nuisances like loading and unloading zones? This is all about the inevitable growth of online purchases and the challenges in accommodating service vehicles. Well, according to Australia Post, online purchases have risen by 57% year on year between 2019 and 2020 and even more so now. This increase has resulted in an additional 1 million households shopping online every month compared to 2019. 82% of Australian households made an online purchase in 2020, or 70% of Americans, as I researched. All these packages need to be put onto the roads somewhere in their journey. Imagine if city skylines had unloading and loading zones, that would be next level realism. Certain vehicles, such as those used for freight, routine, and emergency services, and transportation of people with disabilities, cannot be eliminated. These vehicles have different access and parking requirements compared to cars and must be accommodated. Even in car-free zones in cities, the complete streets approach, which we will discuss in the following section, aims to identify the problems designers encounter with accommodating surface vehicles in pedestrianized and car-free areas. So what are the challenges? The following are the main challenges for accommodating service vehicles on local streets that allow for multiple modes. One, local streets frequently have limited turns and narrow lanes, making it difficult for large trucks to navigate. Two, pedestrians and cyclists often operate in driver's blind spots, resulting in a high risk of collisions. Three, allocating dedicated space for other modes, such as bike lanes, can restrict on-street parking and loading and access to off-street loading docks. 4. Street furniture, bicycle parking, trees, signage, bollards and other roadside or sidewalk obstructions can impede delivery activity, limit vehicle parking and reduce loading activity space. But did you know there are design guidelines for accommodating heavy vehicle traffic alongside other street users? Looking at this diagram of common American vehicle designs, we can see the measurements of vehicles from school buses to semi-trucks, buses and emergency vehicles and the type of road that this vehicle type can adequately turn a corner. 
when creating roads, adequate space and safe large vehicle turns are required. In City Skylines 1, we had Node Controller to assist us in creating safe and guideline intersections and roundabouts. Providing the right amount of space is paramount, and here are a few tips to provide enough room for large vehicles to turn. First guideline principle is that roadway designs with curbside parking lanes or alternative uses can provide space for effective turning at intersections, driveways and loading dock entrances. The extra space helps vehicles take wider turns. Bulbs can be used to shorten pedestrian crossing distances at intersections and maintain online transit loading. The next principle is curbside bicycle lanes can provide extra space for turning vehicles and benefit emergency vehicle access. However, potential conflicts between turning vehicles and cyclists should be marked and freight loading activity may be affected due to the elimination of direct curbside access. If the bike lane is separated from the travel lane by a raised barrier, consideration should be given to a fire hydrant and building access requirements. The next principle of design is the asymmetrical median nose. In areas where there is significant pedestrian traffic and large vehicle turns, a fully graded separated median island may be the safest option for pedestrians. However, limited space may make it impossible to have both a standard median island and obstructed large vehicle turns. To address this issue, an asymmetrical median may be used to maintain complete grade separation between pedestrian and motor vehicle movements while still accommodating large vehicle turns. Nonetheless, this design may reduce the total sheltered space available to pedestrians who are waiting, which could be challenging in areas with exceptionally high pedestrian volumes. An alternative is recessed stop lines, which are solid white lines indicating where vehicles should stop before an intersection or crosswalk, set back to allow large vehicles to navigate restricted turns. Additional pavement markings or signage may be required to ensure driver compliance and consideration should be given to the expected queuing on the recessed approach as this solution reduces the total vehicle storage space available on a block. A final design feature is mountable or flushed curbs. These provide trucks and bus aprons on corners and allow large vehicles to negotiate a chicane or roundabout and allow emergency vehicles to cross divided streets at mid-blocks. For more information I have left a link to the USA Freight, Buses and Emergency Vehicles Design Guidelines books for roads, lanes and turns in the description. Now we turn to shaping cities with public transport and the benefits of bus rapid transit over light rail systems in encouraging urban redevelopment. Investment in public transit infrastructure is one of the crucial interventions that stimulates redevelopment in cities. However, the form in which that infrastructure comes has very different urban design outcomes. While many cities in Australia and around the world have recently made or proposed investments in new light rail systems and bus rapid transit, it is actually BRT that has many advantages over light rail. In fact, my research shows that BRT is more suitable for Adelaide, a city in Australia, and here's the reasons why. BRT is cheaper to construct and run. It takes less time to introduce with less disruption. It allows designated lanes to be left as is and offers greater flexibility to pick up passengers where and when needed. In contrast, retrofitting light rail onto arterial roads has proven expensive, slow and highly disruptive, especially in the case of Sydney light rail. One of the fundamental relationships that underpins transit is the density and land use mix needed to provide different levels of service. Cost per passenger kilometre is a far better indicator of cost effectiveness than cost per kilometre. Transit Orientated Development, or TOD, aims to develop dense mixed-use precincts around transit stops to maximise transit use. The mix of uses ensures commuter travel will flow both ways, workers coming in at the start of the day and residents coming home at night, because density of users is key to the success of TODs. Most are around train and light rail stops or major mode interchanges, fewer around bus stops though. So in City Skylines 2, ensure to put your high density around your rail and metro, not your bus stops only. 
Alternatively to these TODs, urbanist David Sims says we should consider building NOTS, neighbourhood orientated transit, and we will turn to Barcelona, Spain for this one. This picture here shows what 98% of the world's streets look like. But this picture here shows what 1% of cities are doing, like Barcelona. Notice how the buildings are changing too, and the density of people. It's not just the roads. This other one here is the 1% of Barcelona's superblocks. Which one would you prefer to live in? Now let's look at a variety of different street sizes, but from different countries around the world that have changed their road layouts to be more human-centric. This is Copenhagen in Denmark. The busy thoroughfare accommodates a great diversity of users with cycle lanes in each direction and a thin median down the middle. The median is almost flat to make passing possible for vehicles on the one and a half lane wide traffic lane. This is Kensington High Street in London. This also has the same effect as Denmark. Alternatively is Nakaduri Street in Tokyo, Japan. The street is closed for a few hours at lunchtime, like in this picture. Then in the mornings it is one-way traffic into the city and in the afternoon the other way. These are all examples of neighbourhood orientated transits or knots. Unfortunately, until mods come along, it will be very difficult to make knots in City Skylines 2, but you can definitely make them in City Skylines 1. Active travel. As a human, 10,000 steps a day is what health experts say we should be achieving. And part of this is making a city walkable. And this is where the walk score comes in. On this website, you can put in your address or town or city and it will give your actual location a walkable score. Give it a go. Shame I can't put this city of Thornton in. So how is walkable measured? Let's turn to Melbourne, Australia. The index includes an array of maps from residential density, street connectivity with road segments and land use mixes. And you end up with a map like this. The green indicates areas of high walkability, the red is poor. This is another great use of QGIS. The Futurama showcase by General Motors at the 1939 World's Fair presented a bold perspective on the future of urban living. Although some viewed it as an idealised version of a functional city, others saw it as a bleak portrayal of a society built around cars, not people. The picture here shows the ongoing debate among urban planners and designers since the 1960s about the true purpose of cities. A famous quote by Jane Jacobs says, Automobiles are often conveniently tagged as the villains responsible for the ills of cities and the disappointments and futilities of city planning, but the destructive effect of automobiles are much less a cause than a symptom of our incompetence at city building. Since people started rebelling against cities designed by traffic engineers, managing the car has been a primary concern for urban designers. Jane Jacobs, the Joan of Arc of this movement, was living in Greenwich Village in the 1950s when she discovered plans for a Lower Manhattan expressway. For Jacobs, the proposed expressway threatened to destroy a diverse and vibrant community that embodied her vision for cities. This is where Jacobs vs Moses comes in. One of the most significant moments in urban planning history was the Battle of Jane Jacobs where she waged against the modernist vision that had decimated numerous American cities in favour of the basic needs of cars rather than the complex needs of cities. This struggle, according to some, gave birth to the field of urban design. Observing her neighbourhood, Jacobs identified four crucial components that contribute to a vibrant urban life. 1. Multifunctional neighbourhoods with activity around the clock. 2. Short blocks and connected streets that are easy to walk and navigate. 3. Mixed age residential areas, enjoyable and entertaining for all generations. And 4. High concentrations of people, not synonymous with high rises. Jacobs argued that the most appropriate densities for the village were four to six storey walk ups, a similar urban plan as what Paris has. Jacob's conflict with Moses is portrayed in at least three books, various documentaries, and even an opera. 
The article highlights some of the critical moments, including a quote from Jacobs during her interview with James Howard Kunzler of Metropolis magazine, where she recounts her sole face-to-face meeting with Moses. I saw him only once, at a hearing about the road through Washington Square, which was to be an entrance ramp to the Lower Manhattan Expressway. He was there briefly to speak his piece, but nobody was told that at the time. None of us had spoken yet because they always had the officials speak first and then they would go away and they wouldn't listen to the people's concerns. Anyway, he stood up there gripping the railing and he was furious at the effrontery of this and I guess he could already see that his plan was in danger because he was saying, There is nobody against this. Nobody, nobody, nobody but a bunch of, a bunch of mothers. And then he stormed out. Jacob's movement to make cities car-free continues to gain momentum, with supporters touting the environmental, economic and social benefits of such an initiative. To many, it's an exciting prospect for urban design and city restructuring. The pandemic has only strengthened the car-free cities movement and its various components. On the other hand, Moses and his followers are still in favour of cars. Some people point to the unfortunate history of pedestrian malls developed during the 1960s and 1970s as evidence that a city without traffic is a ghost town. So the question to ask ourselves, what stands in the way of the car-free movement? We collectively suffer from a pathology of car dependence, or are car-free places a fantasy to undermine what cities are really for? What do you think? What makes a great street? It is defined by Geifel's Webster, who cites Jacob work as community. A great street should be a most desirable place to be, to spend time, live, work and play. And this should be accomplished through creating slow streets, mixed land uses that offer more balanced activity, and all users in mind from motorists, cyclists, walkers, transit riders, and people with different abilities. It should include street trees, planting, street furnishings, wayfinding, signage, public art, and lighting. But most of all, a great street is built at the pedestrian scale. This includes ample and well-lit ground floor windows. So what makes a complete street? Portland, Oregon saw a 250 increase in its bicycle network between 1991 and 2008, expanding from approximately 75 to 275 total bikeway miles. During this period, ridership increased by 490%, as measured by collecting daily counts over four main bridges, and continued to rise even after the number of bikeway miles had leveled off. The Complete Streets policy approach originated in Portland, Oregon in 1971 and gained prominence as new urbanism grew in popularity. This approach is grounded in the belief that streets should prioritise safety for all users. Street networks should be connected homogeneously to avoid funneling movement in just some directions and congestion is best diminished by offering multiple mobility options. By 2003, Complete Streets had evolved into a distinct policy approach under the umbrella of the Smart Growth Movement in the United States, emphasizing streets as one element of livable communities. Complete streets should have continuous sidewalks, safe bike routes, and accessible public transit. And these features should be connected coherently to ensure direct walking routes. So what are the Complete Streets key principles? The left picture here shows conventional street networks that create longer trips and often deny choice. The picture here now demonstrates complete streets and these offer greater flexibility. Streets should be linked to a network that allows for multiple routes between any origin and destination. Complete streets with continuous footpaths and safe cycle routes encourage people to use alternatives to cars and I can tell you now where I live there aren't footpaths everywhere. Complete streets reduce congestion by providing mode choices that make public transit and active travel easier and safer. So here's an example. Smart Growth America says that parents often cite traffic as a primary reason for driving their children to school, yet in doing so they account for 7 to 11% of non-commuting vehicle traffic during morning rush hour. Let's see how children are getting to school in Thornton. I believe most walk, and I imagine when the game gets bicycles, most of the children will then cycle to school, just as they did in City Skylines 1. Complete streets help make communities more livable, healthier, more pleasant, and better connected socially.
So that is Module 3 completed. Everyone gets an A. Let's find out what is coming up in Module 4. In Module 4, the focus will be on social life in public spaces, with topics such as public safety, public access and right-of-way, connections and through routes, and animating the edges of your city. So feel free to leave a comment on this video on what you thought, and please subscribe if you'd like to keep in touch with when Module 4 will be coming out. And thank you for watching.